The 2022 NFL Draft is quickly approaching, and what a fun three-day period that is. Over 250 young men will get to live out their childhood dreams of becoming NFL players, and will get to stop and smell the roses for a brief minute before it is time to get to work for their new employer, aka the NFL team they were drafted by. And with that many prospects that are going to be drafted, there are naturally going to be some players that are going to be underrated, and players that have seemingly slipped through the cracks, and that's what we're going to to discuss in today's video. We're going to discuss some of the most underrated NFL draft prospects from the 2022 class, and when I say underrated, I want this to be clear. The guys we're going to discuss are players I legitimately think will start for some time. I'm not throwing a dart at a wall here for four seventh round players that may have ran in the 90th percentile and say, well, he has great speed, so hopefully it translates and that's the reasoning. No, it's, it's a lot more in depth than just that, and without further ado, let's begin. And the first prospect we're going to discuss is one of my favorite in the entire class, and it is Wisconsin linebacker Leo Chanel. With all of the hype in this class around players like Trayvon Walker, Aiden Hutchinson, and Leo's position more specifically with Devin Lloyd and N'Kobe Dean, Leo has seemingly fell through the cracks and I really don't know why. I've seen some mock drafts have him go in the top 35 or 40 picks, and I've seen some others have him go in the early third round, and to me if you're a team like the New York Jets or Detroit Lions, basically teams that have a lot of picks and early, why wouldn't you be interested in having a longtime starter on your team that you would be able to get in at the second round? And I think we're going to look back at this draft class, and more specifically Leo, and this draft community will kind of say, huh, why did we overthink this shit out of this when Leo has several great traits that translate to the next level? And sure, Leo isn't the best in pass coverage, but what baffles me or is astonishing to me is people say that as if that dismisses everything else he's good at. And this is a lot different, but the concept stands here, but do we dismiss Tom Brady because he can't make the plays that Lamar Jackson can on the ground? No, absolutely not, and with Leo and other linebackers, this isn't just exclusive to him, but we've kind of got to a point where if a linebacker isn't a Devin White currently, or a healthy Ryan Shazier five or six years ago, you know, the guys that can play sideline to sideline and make play after play, ah, well, shit, screw it, then we'll move them down the board, and I would be shocked if Leo stays healthy and isn't a starter for a team for the next six to seven years. He's as strong as a linebacker can get and did 34 reps on the bench press, which for his position, ranks in the 99th percentile and also ran a 4-5-40. He can do it all and will make whichever team drafts him very, very happy. If there is one day two prospect I am willing to hitch my wagon to and say this player is going to be successful at the next level, it is Wisconsin's Leo Chanel. He has too many positive traits in his game for him to fail at the NFL level, and that doesn't mean he'll never miss a tackle or get burnt in coverage, because he, like every other rookie on defense, will get burnt at some point in time, but he has too many positives going for him, in my opinion, to be a draft disappointment. Next is a player who I've seen at times go in the first round of mock drafts within the past couple of months, but as of recently I've seen him get pushed more and more towards the middle of the second round, and that's Penn State receiver Jahan Dotson. In his final year with the Nittany Lions, Dotson had over 90 catches for nearly 1,200 yards and 12 touchdowns on a team with a not great quarterback situation, and he, and the tape shows, is a playmaker. For receivers, it's obviously more team dependent on where they go, as it's not out of line to say I think Jahan would be more productive if he is drafted by Green Bay and gets to play with Aaron Rodgers versus being drafted by Seattle and whatever the hell they have going on out there at the moment. But over the past few months, other receivers have risen up the draft board, and Dotson has kind of been pushed back like his game all of a sudden isn't good enough or compares with the other guys, and I'm referring to two players in particular here. And before we discuss those players, I want to say this is more for Jahan Dotson than anti either of these players, but it's Sky Moore from Western Michigan and Khalil Shakir from Boise State. To me, Dotson is the superior prospect out of these three, and I think time will show that. I don't dislike Moore or Shakir, to be clear, but I don't think they should be drafted over Dotson, and to a degree, Christian Watson also falls in here from North Dakota State, 
but I understand the hype more for Watson than I do the other two, because he's a 6'5 player with legit 4'3 speed, and quite frankly, those guys do not come around often. It's a short list, which pretty much consists of DK Metcalf, who himself is not even 6'5, and Calvin Johnson, who was a first ballot Hall of Famer, so I understand teams wanting to hype up and convince themselves of Watson, but to me, Moore and Shakir are a lesser version of Dotson. And when you look at Dotson's production in 2021, 11 for 127 in a score against Ohio State, 10 for 78 in a score against Auburn, 8 for 137 in two scores against Michigan State. Now, he did not produce as well as he would have liked against Iowa, as that was a matchup at the time between two top five teams, but what must be known, and of course scouts and NFL teams know this, is Dotson's quarterback was injured midway through the game, and after that, Penn State had a hard time completing a simple pitch and catch pass, and Dotson was obviously affected by that. But the best game of his collegiate career came against Maryland, where he set several school records in an 11-catch, 242-yard, three-touchdown performance. Dotson at near 5'11", 180 pounds, has his flaws in his game, but to me there's too many strengths that consistently show up on tape, and this is a stereotypical, productive receiver in the second round that some team will fall in love with and be happy as hell they drafted him, rather than having to play against him. Next up is a bit of a surprising prospect in the grand scheme of things, but it is Georgia running back James Cook. There are countless Georgia prospects that will be drafted in a few short weeks, and on Thursday at that, meaning in the first round, and a lot of them like Trayvon Walker, Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt, will be called on that Thursday night. But I do believe Cook will enter the draft a little under the radar, as James is a very good route runner for a running back, and immediately will come in and contribute in that manner and become, at worst, really, a check down option on third down when he is on the field. Now, I don't think James will come in and be anywhere close to the player his older brother is, which is of course Dalvin Cook, as he is one of the best players at his position in the entire league, but James can be the glue guy in a running back committee. Will he ever rush for a thousand yards? Probably not, but we see teams routinely draft backs in the third or fourth round to play the Robin role of a running back committee, and this is the type of role I would love James to be in. And then in his final season at Georgia, he had over a thousand yards from scrimmage and 11 touchdowns, and of course was a national champion. Does an NFL team make or break by having the Robin part of a running back committee? No, of course not, but to have a reliable number two back is great for any team, and I'd love to see him on a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers, where he would play behind Najee Harris and be a good second guy to Najee. The Steelers, I would imagine, plan to run the football a lot more over the next few years than normal, than an average team, while they get their quarterback situation taken care of, and having a reliable player behind Najee, rather than just hand him the ball 400 times a year and say, good luck, would be invaluable to keep Najee fresh in both the fourth quarter of games and during the final stretch of the regular season. And next is another defensive player who, aside from Leo, is probably my second or third favorite defensive prospect in the entire 2022 NFL Draft, the other being Jordan Davis from Georgia, and it's Oklahoma's Nick Benito. When I watch Benito on tape over the past two years, this is a guy who's had 26 tackles for a loss and 16 sacks during the 2020 and 2021 seasons. He's 6'3", 250, and sure, his arm length, wingspan, and weight are all below the 20th percentile, and that will naturally turn some people off and think, well, we can get someone else who can do exactly what he can, either cheaper as a veteran free agent or later in the draft. But with Benito, there's a few things I love in his game, and when you look at his mock draftable, you see these show up on tape. Relative to other edge rushers, he's in the 88th percentile for the 20-yard shuttle, meaning he has great lateral agility, and you see that. And his three cone was in the 75th percentile, and his broad jump of 10 feet was in the 74th. To me, Benito is a player who can come in from day one and be the perfect Robin to someone like Odafe Owe's Batman. To be clear, if you draft Nick in the early part of the third round and expect a third round rookie to come in with clear deficiencies in his game and be a 9-10 to sack player from day one, well, be prepared to be disappointed as the almighty Chase Young had 9 in his rookie year as an elite draft prospect and miles better than what Benito is. But as Nick gets into the league and gets more and more comfortable, I love the trajectory of his game over the next few years, and I don't think he's on this Trayvon Walker type projection where you can legitimately say he could have 15 sacks in a season.
season in the future, but with Nick, this is the type of player we discuss when doing draft grade videos, where if you take a said player in the second or third round, you'll love him, and he fits exactly that. And getting Nick in some one-on-one -on -one opportunities against some bigger tackles, think Orlando Brown Jr., or even in this class, Daniel Falale from Minnesota, and there's a chance he can make their Sunday afternoon hell. Nick, to me, is a speed rusher who has the potential to develop into a 9-10 to 10 sack guy per year. He's a guy who you buy low and coach him up and have him be the Robin to someone else's Batman. I don't think he'll ever be the guy like we expect Aiden Hutchinson or Kayvon Thibodeau to be, and that's fine because it's clear. Not everyone is that type of player, but whichever team's drafts Benito will be happy with the consistent and solid production, that will come with the selection. And with that being said, that's all I have for today's video. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, now is the time I ask you to please leave a like and subscribe to the channel, as it would truly mean the world. 40,000 subscribers isn't too far down the road, and all support is very much appreciated. Now let me know what you think of today's video in the comments, and until next time, please be safe and have a great day. Love you guys.